Okay, we're going to let the latecomers trickle in a little bit, but I want to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this evening's Nutshell discussion. Um, if it's your first Nutshell, you're in for a TC perennial treat. My name is Katie Adams, and I am the Research and Demonstration Manager for the Savannah Institute, and this is my first time hosting Nutshells, and I'm excited to be here. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We're a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin and Illinois, focused on agroforestry research and education. We believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore ecosystems, build resilience, and support strong communities of cooperation between farmers, researchers, and perennial industry builders. Um, we do this work through a variety of avenues. We host on-farm field days, and there's still a few left for this year offer print and online resources focused on key agroforestry practices, land access and lease structures, and the basis of establishing tree crops. And these are all available for free online on our website. And we're building a network of research and demonstration farms across central Illinois and southern Wisconsin. <coughs> and we're excited to have our first agroforestry apprenticeship cohort this year who are joining us tonight. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central SARE. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. Um, during this evening's discussions, if you're joining us from a computer, I want you to invite you all to share your questions and comments in the chat box um, on the platform. And I will monitor those throughout the nutshell and make sure to address them during our Q&A session at the end of the discussion tonight. Um, if you're joining us by phone, I'll give you instructions on how to ask a question when we get to that point. Okay, so now on to the main event. Um, we're honored to welcome our presenters for this evening, Kathy Dice and Tom Wall of Redfern Farm. Um, Tom, Kathy, and their two children grow around 80 different perennial crops in an integrated agroforestry perennial polyculture system, and I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Tom and Kathy to get things started. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks for inviting us. I'm Tom Wall. and I'm Kathy Dice. And we're owners and operators of Redfern Farm, which is a biologically diverse perennial farm. We have approximately 70 different species of fruit or nut bearing trees, shrubs, and vines on the farm, and, and about another 10 or 15 perennial vegetables uh, underneath that. And we market just about everything we sell by UPEC. <coughs> uh, chestnuts are a main crop. Uh, they're actually more important than all the rest of them put together by multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, chestnuts are what make it all work, and, and that's what pays the bills. Uh, but a, a few of the, our other economically important crops include pawpaw, persimmon, Asian pear, heart nut, and we hope soon a honeyberry. Uh, a few of the things that didn't work out very well commercially include uh, hazels and aronia berries. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Yep, and now we're on to the nut wizard slide. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and that came up right away. Um, wait, it looks like we skipped one. Maybe. No, no, that was right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so in the beginning, our trees were small and our kids are small. I think what Tom was looking for was a, a slide of Indeed. our kids being very small, gathering just I have that on mine. Yeah, I don't, okay. I don't know where it went. Okay. So at first we did all our own harvesting. Um, at, at first we picked up by hand, didn't use any kind of tools. We picked up in, picked up chestnuts into ice cream buckets, 
that was how small our crop was at first. And the nets were small, and we all found it a very tedious job. And then as the trees got bigger and more and more nets fell, we began to learn about nut wizards, which are a delightful tool that speeded up the harvest. Yeah, the nut wizards allow us to uh, pick up nuts about ten times faster than we can do by hand and without ever having to bend over. The nut wizard is a wire basket mounted on the end of a pole that rolls over the nuts, and the nuts squeeze in between the wires and pop inside the basket. Uh, when it's full, we carry it over to a container and uh, using a, a spreading device, it spreads the wires apart and dumps the nuts into the container. Okay, go ahead to the next slide. Okay, now we're on description of hours per day. Yeah. So as the trees got bigger, more and more nuts were dropping, and it required more time for harvesting. Yeah, the, the blue bucket in the cart will hold about 100 pounds of chestnuts, and one person, even a small person, can easily move that around from place to place in that little wheeled cart. So we went, as we tell people, in the beginning you can put your harvest of chestnuts in your pocket and then into a bucket, and your buckets keep getting bigger and bigger. And by 2013, we had a lot of chestnuts we needed to harvest. And you could go to the next slide. I think it's a picture of Tom. Yeah. Chestnut club. So while all this was going on, I was also uh, acting as marketing coordinator for a small informal cooperative of uh, chestnut growers. And at, at first it was really small. Our first year we did maybe a few hundred pounds. Uh, okay, next slide. This is totally different from my... Well, I was taking a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, by 2013... It had grown to, uh, uh, well, I think uh, I was doing, uh, I sold 34,000 pounds of chestnuts by 2013, and it was taking a lot more time. Uh, I actually had to hire two people to help me uh, with the co-op and then two more people to do the harvesting for me because I had no time to do harvesting myself. Uh, and uh, I was working from six uh, 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. every day, seven days a week, without a break, with a no lunch break, no supper break, uh, n no bathroom breaks. I feel sweating enough that I didn't need a bathroom break all day long. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And shipping chestnuts. Yes, we were shipping as well. It was a busy time. And you can go to the next slide. 2013. Yeah. He, was, he actually okay. hired people yeah. in 2013. Okay, next slide. Because okay. he had people, hired people to help harvest the chestnuts said that. and working the co-op. Okay. <clears throat> also in 2013, we had some uh, customers who were from Europe <clears throat> who begged us to let them pick their own chestnuts. We didn't want to do it because uh, we were afraid of liability and uh, afraid our insurance wouldn't cover it if we, they had an accident. Uh, but they were really good customers. <clears throat> and also um, the dad was dying of cancer, and he, he wanted to pick chestnuts one more time before he died. So we couldn't say no. So <clears throat> what I told him was, okay, go ahead, but don't tell anybody. Well, within <clears throat> about three days, we had a list of 20-some people who wanted to come pick their own after that. Um, by the following year, that list had grown to 70-some, and this year it's 260-some. And you can go to the next slide. It rapidly grew. Yeah. yeah. 
we we have the capacity to have about 25 or 30 groups per year come out. Each name on our list represents usually an extended family, and uh, we can have about 25 or 30 of them per year. So there's a a very large unmet demand for you pick chestnuts. The main problem was the majority of people work, and they could only come out on the weekends. And so in the beginning, especially for the weekends, we had to do a reservation, we had to have a waiting list, and we were very careful to let our oldest customers who were highest highest on our waiting list get first chance to schedule a date to come pick chestnuts. And the weekends would fill up really fast, and uh, it was harder to get people to come on weekdays until we started offering a discount of 25 cents a pound uh, for people who are willing to come on Monday through Thursday, and then uh, people who are coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday would pay the full price. Many of our customers were very eager to get a bargain, and so scheduling a day off because they could get 25 cents less, pay less per pound, was they considered it a great deal. And yeah, and... Uh, Lest you think 25 cents a pound wouldn't amount to much, a lot of these customers were picking 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 or 500 pounds of nuts in a day. So 25 cents a pound added up to a lot of money for them. So in the fall, we would make a, and you can go to the next slide, we would develop a schedule. Oh. And I, we just need to point this out. Um, when people came to harvest chestnuts or anything for our U-Pick, it was a little convoluted because our house is not right where our groves are. So people would come down our gravel road, turn up our lane, go to where our house is. We'd greet them. We'd see if everyone was ready to go, check that their name was on the list. Then we'd drive back down our lane go towards the number four and take them out to the groves, they would be following us in their vehicles as we drove either our Honda or our truck to wherever we planned on having them harvest either chestnuts, pawpaws, or persimmons. And we had to have a good idea how many people were in their group and how many pounds they wanted to harvest so we could figure out which part of our groves they should go to. And if they were also wanting pawpaws or persimmons, that would affect where they went as well. And then once they were all done, spending two or three hours or 30 minutes, they would have to drive all the way back to our house to go ahead and weigh out afterwards. Okay, that's what that slide was about. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, this shows where our customers were coming from. Now, the majority of them were coming from within Iowa, uh, Waterloo, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, uh, Des Moines, and Ames uh, are where the majority of our customers come from. But we also had customers driving all the way from uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, Sioux City, Iowa, (laughs) and we actually had a family drive more than 1,200 miles one way from South Florida once. Now we they were they they were they had relatives <laughs> in Iowa that they were going to visit, but I think they were actually using a, a visit of their relatives as an excuse to come pick chestnuts rather than the other way around. Because they started calling us in April wanting to know what day would be the best day to come pick chestnuts so they could plan their vacation around that day. All right. And once you have your screen back, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Tom likes that slide because we are very proud about how far people will come. And as the next slide is showing, we also started doing pawpaw you picks. And I'm very proud of that because... As we had more and more people coming from the chestnuts, our pawpaw harvesting got neglected. And I was like, well, why don't we do you pick on pawpaws too? And since then, all our marketing has been 
through you pick for the persimmons, aronia, hazels, heart nuts. And pawpaws are great for that because they like persimmons. They don't keep well on the shelf, and people really enjoy going out and harvesting their own. And we have people driving from as far away as Minnesota and Nebraska and Illinois to come pick pawpaws. We had some folks from Chicago today. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so on this slide, it shows another Excel sheet, which is what I basically call our call list or email list. So when we go to farmer's markets or events now, and we talk about how we have pawpaws or persimmons or chestnuts available for you pick, people are like, oh, I'm really interested in that. When is that ready? And I'll tell them, if you give me an email address, I'll put you down on our list, and I will send you an email when things start to ripen, so you know it's time to schedule an appointment. So this is our very simple way of keeping track of people. So I have a phone number or an email from them. I kind of like to remember where they signed up at and what year. And this list for pawpaws is about 120 people long. For other things like the heart nuts, it's only 20 or 30 people long. But when things are starting to ripe and we know we can start scheduling people, I will send out a blast email to all these people, and then they'll and it'll have information about what's going on this year, what you would need to know for coming out to harvest, and people will start responding from that email to say, "Ooh, okay, well I'd like to schedule a date." So that's a very handy thing for us. That's one way we do market. And we can go to the next slide. And this is another Excel sheet which demonstrates how we keep track of who we have contacted about chestnuts. Because chestnuts, because we have to ration those out, we'll go down this list, as I said earlier, calling people and contacting them, saying, you know, we have chestnuts already. You can call us to schedule a date. And I use now color codes to, dem to show myself that we have contacted this person, we've m either left them a message or talked to them on the phone, and a yellow means we actually definitely got the message to them. A white means, like, the phone number's not good for them anymore or bounced back. Pink means we have scheduled a date with them or they're not interested in coming for chestnuts this year. So the color coding helps a lot for us to keep track of who we've contacted. And I also love Excel because we can sort this list by telephone number. So if we have someone who calls us and they say, well, you called us already to schedule a date, I can quickly look up their phone number to double check on that. We also <coughs> keep uh, uh, make notes of uh, customers' behavior sometimes. Some customers <laughs> make cause some problems like you destroy nut wizards or uh, poach other people's chestnuts or something like that. And we have enough customers that we can be selective. And uh, if a customer is causing enough problems, we can just drop them from the list and not call them again. But we have to take notes to be able to do that. Yeah. And we will remove people from the list sometimes if they died or <laughs> or they tell us that they don't want to come and do chestnuts anymore. But that, that doesn't happen. No, it often. doesn't. There's people in the top 20 who, who – that top 20 is a sweet spot, and not many – that doesn't move very much. And you can go on to the next slide. All right, and there's the scheduling one. So I make a schedule sheet. For chestnuts, and then I have a separate for pawpaws and persimmons. And this one is the That's the chestnut. That's the chestnut one, yes. So we'll just, I'll lay out the days. Some weekends I'll put two or three lines per day, but then I'll put down the person's name, their contact information, and very importantly, how much and what they're after. Like, are, do they want just 25 pounds of chestnuts? Are they hoping for 200 pounds of chestnuts? Are they bringing eight adults and four kids with them? So that all helps us keep track of where we're going to put those people. 
And this sheet is one of our older ones. We used to say, um, when people say, well, when should we come? And Tom would say, well, when would you like to come? We now tell people, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And if that doesn't work for them, we'll negotiate. But we try really hard not to have people in the groves before 1 o'clock because that gives the trees more time to ripen fruit and to let chestnuts fall to the ground. Yeah, most of the chestnuts fall between about 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. There's very little falls at night and very little falls in the morning. So if people come in the morning, uh, the nuts from the previous day have already been picked up by people the day before, and then there's just not very much for them to pick up in the morning until afternoon. If they come in the afternoon, then they're, they'll get the maximum number of nuts, especially if they pick from 1 p.m. until sunset or so. And it's so hard for so many of our customers because they're wanting to be here at like 8 o'clock in the morning as soon as possible because they're so excited. And we're like, no, no, don't do that. Because after two hours of searching vainly for chestnuts, they're bored, they're tired, they're ready to go home, and they really haven't found very much. And then just after they leave, that's when the nuts start falling. Like crazy. All right, can you go on to the next slide? Yep. So uh, we provide tools. Uh, we loan them a nut wizard and also a buckets. Uh, the blue bucket there is called a muck bucket, and the, the wheeled cart is a, called a... Uh, muck bucket cart. <laughs> yes, yeah, muck bucket cart. And it will hold about 100 pounds of chestnuts when it's full, but anybody can move it around. And uh, this is a real game changer because they can fill those up in just about a half an hour to an hour or so. And then they'll uh, empty it into a, a tote in their vehicle and then go back and refill it again. And that way they can pick up potentially hundreds of pounds of chestnuts on a good day compared to just picking them up by hand and putting them in a five-gallon bucket. It allows them to pick more. And the more they pick, the more money we make. And often they will, we tell them, just leave the cart behind and they will bring the buckets and the big round totes back to our weighing area. And they can haul that in the truck. We have, uh, in the trunk of their cars, we have had people who have um, called us to say, we need Tom to come <laughs> and get this black tote because we have huge black totes that they'll fill up sometimes too. And sometimes they can't lift them into their car. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Okay. Uh, oh, I, I should mention, too, these nut wizards cost about, uh, nowadays, about $65 a piece. And uh, they don't last forever, and some customers are hard on them some, uh, and damage them, and then they can be hard to repair. But they do pay for themselves by letting the customers pick up a lot more nuts a lot faster and reducing our labor. So we maintain a fleet of them. <laughs> I think we have around 20 or so. Yeah. And often every single one of them will be used, and there will be enough customers that some of them have to do without. And we have to replace a few every year, it seems like, but it's worth it. Yep. And you can go on to the next slide. So we try to keep things as comfortable for our customers as possible. So we now have latrines out there. We have trash cans, um, washing stations, we have a picnic table, and on hot days we'll even take out a cooler with ice water in it and have paper cups for them to use. Yeah. If, if we keep the customers <coughs> comfortable, they stay longer. If, and if they stay longer, they pick more, and if they pick more, we make more. Yeah. So this is an investment, but it's, it's worthwhile. And it's probably important to say, you don't have to do this all at once. All this stuff, the, the nut wizards for the customers, the latrines, the picnic tables, and all that has evolved over a period of uh, about six years. We didn't have this right at the start. And we but wondered where the customers did go, Pete. The, no, <laughs> we, we knew. We, there's, there's woods at the edge of the chestnuts, and we know, we know where they went. <laughs> uh, 
but I'm sure they're happy there's now a latrine. And we keep it beautiful inside. It's painted white. I put in decorations and posters. We have our kids clean them weekly. And it's using a five-gallon bucket so we can empty uh, the human waste twice a week easily to keep the thing smelling nicely. And each of these um, picnic areas is right at the edge of a parking lot. We have grass parking lots in about three places where people can park. Four. Four. So they can get really close to where they're going to be harvesting so they can leave their stuff in the car, they can go back for diapers, go back for water, get whatever they need. We have people who drive to nearby towns, get something to eat, bring it back to the groves for enjoying, too. So, okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. And we do try to make sure things are friendly for the kids. We have lots of ice cream buckets out there because the kids love having their own buckets for harvesting things. We even tried putting out various toys that would be appropriate for kids. That that didn't seem near as popular as just having their own ice cream bucket and getting to pick up their own chestnuts or pawpaws or cherries. And we emphasized to parents that the kids are welcome to eat and taste whatever they want, except for the pawpaws. You have to watch out for the pawpaws. And they can catch um, frogs, snakes, insects but that they should handle all the critters gently and release them when they're done in the groves, too. Yep, okay. And next slide. All right. So when they're done out in the field, we had them in the past driving back up to our house where we would weigh out, and those are all bags of chestnuts there. In fact, I think that was about 257 pounds. 275 Okay, there we go. And that was a very proud family. And one of the things that I have found very effective for marketing is taking pictures of the folks like this, very, very proud at the end of their long day, and posting it on Facebook. And um, these folks are, I believe, are a Bosnian family. They are very savvy on Facebook, and they like to share a lot, which is more advertisement about what's going on at Redfern Farm. Yeah, our, our our advertising doesn't really cost us anything because they're customers do it all for us and that's the best kind of advertising there is because uh, people are much more likely to believe the testimonials of friends and family than they are of a, of a smiling face on a television screen and you can go to the next slide and we're waiting for each slide because that way we remember what it is <laughs> oh yeah so more photos of very proud people and in our um i i was always fascinated by all the um ethnic backgrounds of the people who come to us for example in this photo we have an iowan a gentleman from germany a person from nepal and i think china, china. yeah a couple from china so I have up a big map of the world and a map of the United States, and I ask people to put pins in the map showing where they were from originally. And we have a lot of different pins in that now. Okay, you go to the next slide. Leaderboard. Oh, yeah. And this I was very proud of because I had a chalkboard, and one year I kind of just wrote out how many pounds one group uh, got in one day because they had an impressive amount of chestnuts. And two days later, somebody came in with more chestnuts. They saw this other group's name on there, and they said, well, we have more chestnuts than them. You should put us up on there. And so I went ahead and I put their name on, and they were very proud of that. And I realized people really like showing off how hard they worked. So the next year I got a whiteboard, and we kept track of all the different things that were being harvested, and it would change daily. And this was another thing I would post up on Facebook. In fact, I don't know if Will Crumby is listening, but (laughs) he may like that his name is in this slide. But we've had families and individuals, and personally I just loved seeing how the tally on the chestnuts would go up because it would start out with just like 6 pounds, go up to 20, go up to 80, and it ended up, I think just a few days after this picture was taken, 
uh, the the top chestnut person uh, picked 536 pounds. Yeah, that was pretty impressive. And the people who think that they picked a lot of stuff will look at that leaderboard and go, somebody got 42 pounds of Popeye's, wow! And then they don't think they're 17 pounds. That's all that cool after all. But it, it's, it's, again, another nice way to advertise, putting that up on Facebook. And you can go to the next slide. Improvements. All right. And so our improvements for this year included, um, I've made maps, but the big one is what we call the Little Red Shed. We now have this cute little barn-looking thing right at the entrance of our groves. And this year what we planned is people could pull in at the shed. They wouldn't have to go up to our house. We would check them in, take them over wherever, and then when they were done, they could just come to the shed to weigh out. Nobody needed to go to our house anymore. And you could go to the next slide. And we had our old bed hut looking pretty good, but the red shed is much nicer. Oh, and the maps aren't showing up. I also made maps that would show people different things grow. Oh, there we go. That would um, show people where the roads are, where the chestnuts and persimmons and Asian pears were. And that was very, very detailed maps, but not always easy to read. And you can go to the next slide. And it also, I should say, at, in the red shed and when people check out, we would have recipes available for people, too, and how they should handle their chestnuts and pawpaws. Okay, ah, before, before we take questions, though, there's something I, f I forgot to mention earlier. I, I had said that I didn't want to let people do you pick because I was afraid of liability and our insurance would, wouldn't cover it. So eventually uh, I did contact our insurance man and asked him if it would be okay to have people come out and do you pick. And he said, sure, as long as you don't let them climb trees, don't let them climb ladders, and do not provide transportation to and from the field, you're all covered, and it doesn't, won't even cost you anything extra. He said, and then he said, once you're making over $100,000 a year with the UPIC part of your business, <laughs> then we'll have to add an additional endorsement, which will cost another $8 a year <laughs> on the insurance bill. So we were very happy to hear that. Uh, I know some people have difficulty finding insurance that would cover uh, UPIC operation, but it is out there, and you can find it. Uh, we use State Farm Insurance, and only a small fraction of State Farm Insurance agents in Iowa handle farm policies, and only one who handles farm policies would be able to offer insurance for UPIC business. So you have to find the right insurance agent to do that. Uh, but I'm sure there are plenty of other companies out there that will offer insurance that covers this type of enterprise. Okay, I think we can take Yeah, we got questions a good amount now. of time. We did good. Great. Thank you so much, Tom and Kathy. I'm going to check to see what questions that we have in here. And I apologize if my screen is showing my landing screen. I'm learning as we go along. Um, one question that I, I had throughout the presentation um, was you were talking about how folks who come to you pick um, with you all, kind of, you kind of create a network of word of mouth. How did you originally get those first people who wanted to you pick? Interesting. I'm going to jump in on that one because it we were very fortunate in that Tom was running the chestnut co-op, so we already had people used to coming to us to buy chestnuts. And we basically tied into that list. But once those few people who were gathering the chestnuts let other people know that Tom and Kathy were doing UPIC and the word spread, it was word of mouth within that community. But for things like pawpaws, what I found most effective was going to a farmer's market handing out samples of pawpaws, selling pawpaws for $7 a pound, but telling people, if you come to my farm and harvest and do you pick, you can get these same pawpaws for $3 a pound. And their eyes would get really big and, you know, ka-ching, ka-ching would go off in their head. So offering samples 
at farmers markets that are within an hour drive of your farm and getting people to sign up so you can send them that email and let them remind them okay persimmons are ripe or pawpaws are ripe or hazels are ripe that becomes a really good way to build your customer list and but, but backing up when the co-op first started and our chestnuts were first starting to produce nuts uh, we didn't have a, a customer base, and the first marketing coordinator for the co-op um, mostly went out uh, selling chestnuts to grocery stores. Mm. And we actually don't know how the first Korean customers found out we had chestnuts, but somehow um, s- somebody did and uh, spread the word within their community, and uh, um, almost overnight we had a large customer base of Koreans, uh, but they only wanted large and extra-large chestnuts, and we were unable to sell small and medium-sized chestnuts, and we we thought after a couple of years that there just was not a market for small and medium-sized chestnuts, <clears throat> and we actually started a, a spin-off company uh, to process small and medium-sized nuts into kernels, so we would have a, an outlet for them. But just about the time we got that company up and running, a Bosnian man showed up at the farm. We have no idea how he found out we were there, but the only size he was interested in was medium, and he took all we had at that time, took him back to Waterloo, tried to keep it a secret where he got him, and failed. And uh, the next year we had half a dozen Bosnians down here, all wanting medium-sized chestnuts. And... Uh, after that, uh, medium size was our most popular size, and we actually had a two- to four-year waiting list for medium size uh, later on. And then somehow a Chinese woman found we had small chestnuts. Uh, she lived in Neosho, Missouri, and uh, we mailed, a, I think it was maybe 100 pounds of chestnuts to her, and Turned out she was a member of a forum for Chinese women living in the United States with 5,000 members, and within a matter of days we had calls from Chinese women all over the country wanting small-sized chestnuts, and we've had markets for every size ever since. But we don't know how the first ones found out. (laughs) But I would say Facebook is very, very helpful because people will put and having those keywords up on your website so that when people are searching for, like, pawpaws, persimmons, or whatever unique thing you're growing, they get um, your farm coming up. And utilizing the so many different websites, uh, like Savannah Institute's Perennial Farms or your local food co-ops where they're willing to list your farm, getting your name out and getting what you have to offer in different places so that people can find you because there'll be people out there looking and it's amazing how hard it can be to find you sometimes even though you think you've got it out there a lot of different places we just had a person stopping yesterday who was looking for chestnut acres which is the name of the farm that we bought from our neighbors back in 1998 or 2001. Yeah, and it, that name has not been anywhere for over a decade, but that was what she was focused on, finding chestnut acres, which led her to us. So it's interesting how what sort of things will bring people to you. Well, it sounds like that just your, the way that you conduct business allows the relationships to flourish, and it's very relationship-based. Mm. Yes. Um, one question, oh, I forgot to remind folks that if you're calling in on the phone, you can press star six, um, and that will put you in the queue to ask a question. Um, and if you're joining us over the Internet, you can stick your questions in the chat box on the web application. Um, one question that popped up was, are you planning to expand since you have waiting lists for UPIC? Could you repeat that question? Are we going to expand? Are we going? Okay. I tell Tom, no, we will not expand. However, um, <clears throat> this past winter, 
uh, we had so much rain starting a year ago in September uh, that it saturated the soil, and the soil was still saturated when it froze solid in November, and it was still saturated in March when it thawed, and before it had a chance to drain, the rain started again. So we had 10 consecutive months of saturated soil, which is really hard on chestnuts. And we've lost quite a few, and we have no chestnut crop this year. We're going to have to actually expand just to get back to where we were a year ago. Well, we're going to be planting trees, but yes. we're going to be careful about where we plant chestnuts. Yes. They're going to go on really well-drained soil. Yeah. <laughs> and we do price very simplistically. So everything except for the chestnuts is rounded off. So um, Asian pears are $2 a pound. Persimmon, $2 a pound. Pawpaws, $3 a pound. We keep it very, very simple. Heartnuts, $4 a pound. Depending on if they're yeah. husked or not. One other question that someone is asking is, are there crops that you don't recommend for you pick in your experiences? Oh. Um, um, aronia berries have not worked out very well. In fact, for the last couple of years, we've been offering aronia berries for free, and uh, occasionally we'll get a few people picking a half pound or a pound or so, but they're really not popular for you pick. Um, the, we have had a few people picking hazels, but uh, it really doesn't amount to much income. Which leads us into the other thing we're doing new this year is we started charging what we call a $15 entrance fee or minimum. And it's basically say, telling, warning people up front that they need to spend $15 when they come. Mm -hmm. And for most of our customers, they're like, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but for the folks who are coming for hazels or ronaberry, they might pick seven pounds of hazels, and that's only $7, and 20 pounds of aronias, which are free. And so they would end up paying. Um, so the entrance fee becomes a $15 credit. Whatever you buy at our farm, you recognize Kathy Dice. You've already paid fifteen dollars. So yeah, another thing that hasn't worked out is uh, kusa fruit. Kusa, is, <laughs> kusa is a a type of dogwood that produces an edible fruit, um, and they taste really good, but they're rather inconvenient. Have a good day. Uh, <clears throat> as usual, they, they have a thick, gritty skin that you don't want to eat, so you have to bite a hole in the you side of the fruit and back. suck the innards out and strain the seeds out. Do you want to what? Eventually, I do want to pick mallet back up. So, uh, the, do you want what? Pick This, this, back up. this oh. past winter, um, all of our kusa... Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. That was short. <laughs> <laughs> and another one I would say is we have spice bush growing on our place, and we charge like eight dollars a pound or like a dollar an ounce. Yeah. But it's so small that anytime people get even like half a sandwich bag, which might be a dollar, sort of Tom just says, "Oh, just keep it." <laughs> so. Yeah, spice bush is not a big money maker. <laughs> Uh, in fact, most of the crops on the farm are just experimental and uh, uh, will probably never be big money makers. But uh, And you could think of them as drawing people in because it becomes an experience to be here at Red Fern Farm. You're coming for pawpaws and you're getting to take home some chestnuts, but, ooh, I can taste some spice bush and I can go ahead and try whatever this kusa is and look and maybe taste some persimmons. So it's kind of fun for all the different things you can explore while you're here. But chestnuts are the one that makes makes the real money, and and it wouldn't it wouldn't work without chestnuts. I'm going to open the Q and A session um, quickly to see if there's anyone that wants to call in and ask a question. Okay, it looks like there's no final questions. 
um, to okay. wrap up the evening. Any final words of wisdom, especially for um, apprentices or beginning farmers who are interested in UPIC? You gotta like people to do this. If you if you want to be a farm and be left alone, don't get into UPIC. And don't quit your day job in, until you have this whole thing up and running. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening, uh, Tom and Kathy. I learned a lot, and I know folks on the webinar learned a lot too. Um, we'll have this recording up on YouTube and hopefully edited by someone much more talented than I. Um, <laughs> but uh, it'll be up in the next few weeks on our YouTube channel. And I'll ask folks that if you joined us tonight to please fill out the evaluation that we'll email to you. Um, it only takes about two minutes, and it helps me and helps the Savannah Institute provide better education that's helpful for, for all folks that are joining us. Um, and I'd also like to plug the perennial farm gathering that the Savannah Institute is hosting. We do this yearly. This year, it's December 5th and 6th at the Cincinnati Mound Center outside of Dubuque, Iowa. And you can get all that information on our website. And I have never been to a meeting or a gathering that I've learned more at than the perennial farm gathering. So we'd love to see you there. So thanks again. Kathy and Tom, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your season. All right. Thank you.